Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Canadine, President of the British Academy, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all virtually from wherever in the world you may be zooming in to the final session of this Future of the Corporation Summit. The British Academy exists to deepen our understanding of people, societies, and cultures, past, present, and future, with the aim of helping us all to progress and prosper better and more wisely. Our fellowship of over a thousand leading scholars in the humanities and social sciences explores the full range of human experience and behavior, from politics to art, the law to psychology, and economics to philosophy. The Future of the Corporation program is an outstanding example of the Academy's work and of its ability to draw on such a wide range of people and of their ideas. And over the last few days, we've heard some outstanding thoughts, suggestions and proposals to reimagine and repurpose how we do business and how in so undertaking it, we build a more inclusive and sustainable economy and a more fair and just society. This programme has always aimed to make new connections, to encourage debate and to develop new insights. So I'm delighted that you can all join this conversation with us today at this challenging and pivotal time to discuss what we can learn from crises past and present as we try to build back better and shape our future together. In my foreword to the programme's Principles for Purposeful Business published last year, I quoted the economist Milton Friedman, who in 1982 wrote in his book, Capitalism and Freedom, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. Through the future of the corporation program over the last three years, the British Academy has brought together some of the best thinkers and practitioners on these issues, working with 1,500 business leaders, investors, policymakers, and academics to reconceptualize the role of companies and corporations in society today. Thanks to them and to their work and to their conversations and interactions, a lot of very good ideas are not just lying around, but are actively available and we hope that they will provide the basis for creating a more purposeful and responsible economy that measures the value and accomplishments of business in social and environmental terms, as well as in terms of profits and dividends. It was also, of course, Friedman who did so much to popularize the notion of profit being the sole purpose of business. Yet there are many historical examples of successful businessmen and businesswomen who conceived their activities and understood their obligations in much wider terms. As the great Josiah Wedge would put it, I work at business because business is life. It enables me to do things. And so indeed he did do many things as a model employer who felt a strong obligation to support his local community, as a promoter and backer of innovations in transport, especially canals, as a discerning patron of the pure arts and the applied arts, and as a committed campaigner against the scourge of slavery. Wedgwood's words were wise in his time and they are no less relevant here now to us today. And they are but one example of the many ways in which history is the indispensable guide if we are to learn from previous efforts that societies have made to rebuild from earlier crises. Many are likening the effect of the current global pandemic to that of the two world wars and the Great Depression. These led to paradigm shifting social reforms, such as universal health care, at least in some countries, unemployment benefits, state pensions, and higher levels of taxation. It remains to be seen exactly which changes will emerge from this current crisis. But I'm confident that those of you gathered here on the virtual platform and among the virtual audience will continue to help us in charting an inclusive and sustainable path out of it and in recognizing 
the opportunities and the obligations that this creates for businesses and corporations, both nationally and globally. Finally, I would like to thank our many supporters and corporate partners, without whom none of the programme's work over the past few years would have been possible. And in particular, our principal supporters, the Society for the Advancement of Management Studies and the Immersi Foundation. So let me now hand over to Rula Kalaf, editor of the Financial Times, and we are very thrilled, honoured and delighted that she has kindly agreed to chair this session. Rula, welcome and over to you. Hello uh, everyone, uh, I'm Rula Khalaf, the editor of the FT. Let me first thank the British Academy and Sir David for having us here today to discuss the role of the corporation in the future. It's something that we at the FT think and write about um, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, the British Academy has been at the center of thinking about corporate purpose. Many CEOs have been grappling with the same question, and we saw expressions last year of a redefinition of the purpose of the corporation that takes us beyond maximizing shareholder value. We have also lived through months of lockdown during, during a pandemic that has brought us an extraordinary health, but also economic crisis. Recent months have been some of the most testing the world has ever, ever seen. I never imagined we'd be, uh, I'd be moderating around the table on Zoom, for example. We are, of course, on the way to recovery now, but we also know that there's going to be scarring and that we will have to get used to a new normal and that companies will have to make choices. As Sir David said, in crisis, there is also opportunity. And so we can hope that this moment of crisis can lead to actions that we thought were unthinkable in the past, because this is a chance to reimagine our world and to rebuild with purpose in mind. Climate change is one of the many issues where there is opportunity amid the crisis. I'm sure that the pandemic, climate, and the corporation are at the heart of what we are about to hear from our keynote speaker. Mark Kearney, of course, needs no introduction. He's the former governor of the Bank of England and the Bank of Canada, and he is now serving as the UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance. Over to you, Mark, and I'll see you at the end of um, of your speech for a roundtable discussion. Thank, thank you very much, Rula. Thank you, David. Uh, let me thank the British Academy for uh, today's, uh, the events this week, but also for the broader um, uh, initiative over the past few years led by Professor Colin Meyer. Um, I mean, really more than ideas uh, lying around uh, fully grounded uh, uh, action plan that is there. Now, um, the topic is what can we learn from crises past and present? Uh, to help solve uh, problems of people and planet. Um, and I want to try to set the scene. I'm, it's not going to surprise you given my background. I'm going to draw heavily on financial crises uh, and I'll try and pick up four lessons from those uh, and consider how they can apply to addressing the climate crisis. So one aspect of broader societal purpose. Uh, but I want to start with uh, a broader lesson from crises, uh, which is that, um, and it was alluded to in the introductory comments, that every crisis calls into question aspects aspects of how we value and what we value as a society. So how we value within financial markets and what we value as a society. Um, and that's because crises normally have some form of misvaluation uh, at their heart. Um, the global financial crisis, for example, was caused by the underpricing of risks and the surrendering of supervisory judgment effectively to the wisdom, perceived wisdom of the market. Uh, the climate crisis is first and foremost uh, caused by the tragedy of the commons, where we're not fully pricing externalities from pollution, we're effectively ignoring uh, the costs of uh, environmental degradation and species loss, but also the tragedy of the horizon, where we're undervaluing the future, uh, creating a terrible legacy for future generations. And the COVID crisis is in part, uh, reflects uh, years of undervaluing resilience, despite ample and varied warnings uh, of this risk. 
Um, in fact, the annual uh, advanced preparation costs uh, for this would have been less than one day's um, lost economic output uh, this year. Um, the second lesson, moving to sort of lessons from financial uh, or, or general crisis again, sorry, is that crises lead to changes in strategies. Um, and of course, the question that's on the table is strategies for whom or for what benefit. Um, those attending this summit already know well that um, companies have stakeholders, employees, shareholders, creditors, customers, suppliers, and their communities. Um, but companies are also uh, stakeholders themselves. They have interests and responsibilities for the economic and social and environmental systems in which they operate. And it's these joint responsibilities that get brought together and brought to the fore at times of great change. And that's whether it's tectonic shifts uh, brought by new technologies as part of the fourth industrial revolution, shifting geopolitics, which are affecting, uh, shifting us from globalization to deglobalization, or changing uh, social values, uh, in including renewed imperatives for social justice and equity. Into this mix comes the COVID crisis, triggering both a strategic reset, I'd argue, for companies and a social reset uh, for countries. And purposeful corporations recognize that they need to align their strategy to those, uh, those values and that their actions will be decisive in helping to achieve those goals. Um, and I'll just spend a moment on, on the economic drivers of the, of the strategic reset. Um, there is an acceleration of change in the economy, uh, new values of drivers. The, we, we, this has uh, off observed uh, these types of meetings, evidence of uh, the, the acceleration of the digital economy in all its aspects, uh, shift to global supply chain, from global supply chains, just in time to just in case local supply chains. Um, consumer attitude shifting as entire populations have brushes at least with unemployment and feel the anxieties of inadequate uh, access to health care um, and a wholesale financial restructuring which is yet to begin but is coming uh, particularly in large uh, emitting uh, sectors um, and in an economy where there is substantial uh, additional debt in the private sector. So for all those reasons if you had the right strategy coming in uh, to this crisis you're likely at, at a minimum uh, to have to adjust that strategy to those new realities. On top of that, a social uh, reset. Um, we've recognized in recent months that we're not independent individuals. We need to act as part of an interdependent uh, community. And so the values of dynamism and efficiency joined by those of solidarity, uh, fairness, compassion. Um, secondly, recognition about inequalities more greatly exposed. Uh, we may all be in the same storm, as someone said, uh, but we're not all in the same boat. Um, and Francis uh, Grady, I thought, drew attention to this very well yesterday. Um, thirdly, resilience, clearly more highly valued. Uh, we have to learn from the current predicament. COVID proves that you can't wish away systemic risk. Um, and certainly that is no more the case than it is with climate, uh, which involves the whole world and from which we can't self-isolate. Um, so there's a strategic reset, and that strategic reset needs to be aligned with the social reset. And I would argue that in the UK, where uh, the transition to net zero is an agreed imperative, it's actually legislated, uh, and of course it's an imperative of climate physics, that strategic reset now is the time for that reset to be aligned uh, with a transition to net zero. Um, the third lesson is... Uh, Invariably, and now I'm moving to finance, invariably with financial crisis, uh, part of the response is to improve reporting. Um, after the 29 crash in the United States, that gave birth to the SEC. And the first thing the SEC did was to put in place a common reporting standard, ultimately known as, as GAAP, in order that there was truthful and uniform financial data. Um, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, uh, we did a series of things in order to expose systemic risks and have consistent reporting. So we had, I mean, this is remarkable, but true, a $500 trillion derivative market, which was unreported, um, unregulated, um, and, and stuck in a, a complex web of bilateral trades. Um, and the first thing we did was actually get the information behind those trades uh, and have them reported. Uh, we put in place something called IFRS 9, which has just come into place, which put, um, has banks uh, report the expected losses uh, from loans as opposed to the incurred losses. So a truer picture of the health of their balance sheets and also helping to reduce pro Uh We've made changes to securitization, which again show real risks uh, that the banks have. 
Um, and also we had the banks uh, develop uh, something called enhanced disclosure, which reported how they actually manage uh, their risks. So again, clear response in terms of reporting. You can probably predict where I'm going with this in terms of turning to climate, uh, which is to talk about the TCFD. Um, but let me draw a distinction here and underscore it, which what's happened with past financial crises is after the horse has left the barn, if you will, we've, we've, we've been improved, um, I'm, just, I'm, I'm gonna be tortured by my analogy, which never do an analogy on the fly, but we tried to improve the barn after the fact, improve reporting um, after the fact. We won't get an after the fact with the climate crisis. We have to improve reporting in advance. And I think James Gorman, uh, who's the CEO of uh, Morgan Stanley said it well, uh, a few months ago when he was testifying uh, in front of Congress and he was asked whether climate uh, change is really a financial risk. Uh, and it was, a, it was a short answer, probably the shortest answer in, in, in terms of uh, testimonies. Uh, and he said, well, it's hard to have a financial system if you don't have a planet. Um, and that's the point. Uh, if we, we, we can't do this ex post, we have to do it ex ante. Um, and the good news is that the best in the private sector have taken it into their own hands, developed these standards, the TCFD standards. They're now backed by $140 trillion of balance sheets. So all the large asset managers, major banks, insurance companies, pension funds, Hiro Mizuno, who was on uh, earlier today, would be another example of someone who's uh, backed the Japan pension fund. Um, and they're in place. And they're in place in a way that I think is consistent um, or they're supported, they're not yet in place. That's the key thing, they're not comprehensively in place. But they are consistent with the principles behind purposeful businesses, the eight principles, because it's not just about static reporting and metrics, uh, but it's guidance on governance and risk management, how climate-related risks are actually managed. And it's also forward-looking, looking at scenario analysis and how companies intend uh, to adjust. Now, these have been, uh, these standards have been uh, around for about three years, two reporting cycles. They've been refined, there's huge backing for them. And the issue we're putting on the table for COP26 is to create pathways to make these mandatory. They need to be comprehensive and consistent um, so that uh, these risks can be assessed by uh, all stakeholders. Um, moving to uh, the fourth, uh, fourth lesson from crises that I, I draw attention to, which is to reinforce this point around resilience. I mean, we clearly had a fragile financial system uh, going into the financial crisis, and we did a series of things in order to make it stronger, um, more capital, more liquidity, etc. cetera. Um, the other thing we have done, which has proven effective, I should say, that financial regulators, of which I used to be part, have done, is to stress test uh, the banks against a wide range of potential scenarios. Um, deflation, inflation, massive depressions, sharp change in trading arrangements, et cetera. Um, and part of the reason to do that is to protect against risks that you don't, you can't imagine or you don't know uh, are, are coming. Um, this is really building uh, resilience for a reason, for the, for the purpose. Uh, it's there to be used when the unexpected happens. And what's happened, of course, the unexpected has happened is, uh, is the COVID pandemic. And the banks are in a position uh, as a consequence of not just building up their capital, but running stress tests against them. They're in a position to be part of the solution as we start to build back better. So what does this mean for climate? Um, we all know that there are both physical and transition risks to climate, but the big risks, at least uh, from the financial sector perspective, are principally transition risks. Um, and so the risk is associated with banks not adjusting their strategy or other financial institutions not adjusting their strategy to what needs to be done in order to um, uh, be on a path to net zero. Um, and what we're worried about is if there's a sudden sharp adjustment, a so-called Minsky moment in the adjustment of climate. Um, and after all, if you look at very simple and very generous climate budgeting, so if you don't use one and a half degrees, which is the core objective of, of Paris, uh, but if you use under two degrees, um, more than three quarters of the world's known coal reserves, uh, half of our gas, global gas reserves, again proven, um, and a third of oil reserves are unburnable. Um, so they're on someone's balance sheet and um, they are not ultimately going to be realized. Um, and climate stress testing is one of the ways to bring that to the fore. And I'll say a couple more words on that. But I would note, um, uh, I would welcome uh, the measure that was taken by uh, BP uh, last week, which was to look at both the long run oil forecast, but also what a reasonable carbon price could be over the medium term if we're moving to net zero and then adjust 
uh, their balance sheet accordingly with, uh, in, their, in their case, 11 billion pound write down of some of their old energy assets, if I can put it that way, but also strategically pointing them uh, towards the future. So that's why uh, we're working towards having climate stress testing is to develop this expertise, particularly in the banking sector. Um, and uh, expect it's not just the Bank of England, but a broad uh, coalition of central banks will be applying that. I'll draw your attention to one other thing related to this, which is actually today, it turns out that this group of central banks, 60 central banks are publishing a series of climate scenarios that are open source and can be used by anyone in the financial sector and the real economy. There's eight different, effectively eight different scenarios and you can take them and adjust and they're both the climate variables, but the macroeconomic consequences. Okay, I wanna hear the panel too, so I better speed up and let me get to um, my final lesson, which is the importance of embedding um, and establishing a sense of purpose in business. And I'll say, I think it does bear repeating, one of the challenges in the run-up to the crisis is banking became about banking as opposed to bank clients, uh, increasingly about transactions, not relationships, counterparties, not clients, um, and instruments that had been designed to help clients protect against risk were used to uh, lever exposures and uh, bets, uh, place bets on financial outcomes. Um, and a series of incentive problems uh, grew up. Um, now, we took a series of steps to change that, aligning compensation uh, to risk and reward in the UK. Uh, that stretches out to uh, up to seven years with uh, uh, malice and clawback. Um, we uh, instituted a series working with the private sector, series of codes of conduct. But most importantly, I would argue, was putting in place the senior manager's regime, which re-links uh, again uh, seniority and accountability um, and uses, I didn't, you know, uh, creates a responsibility for managers um, to take reasonable steps to, um, to train people, to provide proper oversight and align strategy uh, accordingly. Um, now, what can we do to embed uh, purpose in terms of client? I wanted to say a couple words and then I will finish uh, in, from a financial perspective, financial sector perspective. So I'm not speaking directly to clients or to uh, companies here. Um, but the core objective for the private finance work of COP26, which is a subset of the much bigger COP26 effort, is to make sure that every financial decision, professional financial decision, takes climate into account. Um, and that's an opportunity for finance as a whole to reassert its purpose. For banks, um, effectively what we want to do is, is bring the SMR principles into the heart of, of bank management of climate uh, risks. Um, that's being reinforced by things such as the supervisory expectations of regulators, including those 60 central banks led by the PRA uh, of the Bank of England. Um, and so that's governance, that's risk management, use of scenario analysis, and appropriate disclosure of that. And then the big thing, I'd argue the big thing is on investors. So the question for investors from asset owners to asset managers is, are you investing your client's money in line with their values? If this, this country as a whole, uh, whether it's in polling, voting records, legislative records, has an objective to move to net zero by 2050, are you investing your client's money in line with that? And how can you tell them, how can you demonstrate that that is indeed the case? Is it, do you appeal to conversations you may or may not be having uh, with, uh, with businesses? Um, is it your voting record or can you measure how those companies themselves uh, are transitioning. And of course, there's a chicken and egg issue, which we should expose and we are exposing um, and address uh, because it's hard to say whether a company is transitioning if they haven't published a transition plan, uh, but you have to ask them uh, for a transition plan. Um, and so part of what we're looking to do is uh, to build on things like the TCFD, but ensure that investors have the tools uh, to assess the credibility of company transition plans, um, measure them against the art of the possible, see who's a leader or a lagger relative um, to what's necessary to achieve net zero, and also to report in a comprehensive fashion their own portfolios in ways that are understandable for their clients. Now, our suspicion, our view, is that that is not an ESG rating. It's not boiled down to one number. Uh, there's lots of merit in the better ESG, but it tends the S and the G tend to dominate the E. 
and um, Colin, that the E here is only environment in the way I'm talking about it, but of course, if you have the employee element, there's a further blending of issues, which is hard to, uh, hard to see. We also don't think that a binary taxonomy, which is just green and everything else brown, is consistent what's, with what's necessary, which is a whole economy transition. I used the example of BP earlier. Um, there is not a taxonomy that would put BP or any energy company in the green, yeah, any large energy company, let me amend that, in the green camp. But a, a company that's moving from brown to beige to olive to green uh, is central uh, to the transition and we need tools in order to do that. So that is part of what we will be working through. Um, once investors have this information and have this information in a consistent way, um, there is a question uh, whether they should, how they express their view. They, do they express it in the market? Do they have a say on transition analogous to say on pay, some would argue, um, uh, and would welcome, uh, welcome views on that. Um, so let me conclude um, by uh, saying there are many lessons from uh, past crises. Um, this is a, it's not a, you, we often feel that crises are unique circumstances. This is not unique, but this is very large and it brings a social reset in my view alongside um, necessary economic uh, adjustments. Um, and we have an opportunity um, to shift the economy, to have a whole economy transition, turning an existential risk into what is, in my view, probably the greatest commercial opportunity of our time, uh, and one that puts people and planet first. And with that, uh, I'll hand back to Rula, and thank you for letting me go on. Mark, thank you for these very thoughtful remarks. You give us a, a lot to talk about in our discussion. Um, we will be joined by um, a very distinguished uh, panel, but I will start um, with you. And um, I'll introduce the panelists in a, in a moment. And I would appreciate if they said just a couple of words about uh, themselves before they, they, um, before they answer questions. Um, okay, thank you very much. My name is Alistair Phillips-Davis. I'm the Chief Executive of SSE, uh, which is a leading UK-based uh, and FTSE 50 infrastructure and clean energy company. Um, as, a, as a company, we're a firm supporter of the future of the corporation project. We think it's vital that it succeeds in its mission to reshape the nature of corporations in the long term. Um, we believe it's in all of our interests that public corporations and private enterprise reset their relationship with the societies that they serve. Um, and what I'd like to do is give a very current, a very live example of the power of purpose during a crisis and how this has particularly helped SSE. Providing profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet was the inspiration behind SSE's purpose and strategy, which we recently sharpened up. Um, and have articulated in the annual report very clearly uh, that's going to be uh, published towards the start of next month. Our purpose to provide the energy people need today while building a net zero world of energy in the future gave a very clear focus when the um, virus struck. And I think keeping power flowing on our networks and from our power stations was an absolute crystal clear focus for everyone uh, in our company. There was a lot of change to the processes that we had um, and uh, our colleagues had to do an awful, uh, an awful lot to make sure that all our colleagues and our customers were safe. I think I'd like to thank all of our staff, our partners, our suppliers, and also trade unions who contributed uh, to a fantastic effort in developing our response, a really positive response to the coronavirus crisis. I think um, despite this, um, uh, to, to, to go back to something Mark mentioned, climate change is also uh, a key part of what we're about. Um, and as we looked, uh, as, as we looked forward at various stakeholders we had, um, the communities in which we operate and our supply chains were important to us. So we moved quickly to provide flexible community funds to deal with the immediate crisis. Uh, there were a variety of things that we did, uh, ranging from providing hand sanitizers into communities to phones, uh, meals for vulnerable people. We repurposed uh, a lot of funding that we had to do that. Um, but also, uh, as, as well as doing that, we supported key suppliers who, uh, who had to furlough a lot of staff. Um, we would need them again to rebuild networks uh, and to potentially uh, provide uh, workers for the green recovery, which we, uh, which we hope will be coming very, very soon. 
However, behind all this, as Mark said uh, earlier, we knew that the climate emergency uh, was still waiting. It remains as acute as, uh, as, as ever, uh, and it was just the same um, uh, before the virus as we now emerge uh, into living with the virus. And so now as a company and a country, we need a razor-like focus on a green recovery. To that end, uh, about four weeks ago, we published our green print, which was a set of 15 practical proposals for government as to how they can help frame policy that will invigorate uh, a green economy and a green recovery. And as a company, um, we've been fairly quick out of the blocks. We've been able to put our money where our mouth is, I suppose, was one of the comments in the newspapers. Um, uh, just over a week ago, we announced uh, a new £3 billion offshore wind farm that will be the largest in Scotland. And we've also um, taken a final investment decision on the UK's largest onshore wind farm uh, on Shetland, which will uh, be about £580 million pounds worth of investment. Um, both of those have been done in pretty challenging market conditions. They both have significant merchant elements to them. Uh, and we've obviously seen commodity prices uh, be significantly impacted um, by both the coronavirus and uh, a lack of demand and other things uh, more globally, uh, including the odd global spat between a couple of countries at the start of all this. Um, I, I think to, to sort of draw this to a, a close, the point is that our clarity of purpose uh, uh, and uh, to provide energy in a net zero world focuses the board, the executive team, and I think motivates all our staff right up to the front line in terms of what they need to do. Uh, and it's with that purpose aligning with society's objectives uh, that we believe the impact uh, of, uh, of the green recovery. Um, it has a potential to be incredibly powerful, not just through this crisis, but for the longer term uh, as we emerge from this crisis and what will clearly be uh, a, a difficult uh, economic environment. And it's something that we've certainly been able to build a very strong narrative around for um, staff, suppliers uh, and key partners throughout the business. So with that, I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Right. Um, Alistair, thank you uh, for, for that. In fact, I'd like to follow up with you with a, with a quick question. You talked about the economic difficulties, and clearly many companies today are facing uh, all kinds of pressures, pressures on shops, pressure on um, revenues. Um, how do you manage all of these priorities and yet uh, remain true to uh, purpose and in particular to your what you want to do in, in terms of uh, of setting your your energy foot footprint because you are an energy company I imagine that you know all of the projects the investments that you do in clean energy is, is to offset yeah I, th I think first of all we are fortunate that we're in a business where um, we hadn't lost all of our turnover we hadn't lost all of our customers um, and as I think I, I said we had a really really clear goal uh, the most important things for us were to keep our critical workers uh, there's between four and five hundred of them that we test two or three times a week they run control rooms uh, and they're in essential positions that really keep the energy flowing to keep hospitals, homes, and things like that powered. If and we lose able, that, you're able to provide job security to guarantee job security, for example. Yeah. So, so, uh, and we did that uh, not only to our own employees. So we have no furlonged uh, uh, furlonged employees. Um, we have some that are that are unproductive at the moment, but that's down below 200 now. So, with uh, a lot of use of IT, a lot of reworking of safe practices. Uh, we've got probably 98 plus percent of our staff working. And as I mentioned, uh, there were key suppliers in key areas um, where, who wanted a furlong or um, actually make staff redundant. And we've had to provide funding to them. We're in a position that we're able to do that with the strength of our balance sheet. But I think it was important uh, to do all those things. And indeed, coming out of that, we got, um, we got a lot of corporations, I mentioned earlier, from trade unions and other people in terms of moving forward. So I think it's about creating a positive environment for people, but the, the ability to get a laser-like focus was extraordinary. And certainly even for us in IT, we spun up from 1,000 to 10,000 people working remotely uh, in about a week. Uh, and we did things that the IT director thought would take more than six months uh, in about eight days because there was yeah. just an absolute focus. People weren't I think we've, always, we've, we've all been amazed with what um, 
with how um, IT can allow us to work uh, remotely so so efficiently. Um, and one other question for you, Alistair. I read that you were still intending to pay dividends, and that's quite a controversial issue right now. There are a lot of companies that have decided not to pay not to pay dividends. Um, how are you justifying it? And are you are are you having um, to uh, defend that? I don't think we've had uh, any particular criticism or, or been required to defend it. Uh, at, at the end of the day, from an investor perspective, we're very much a dividend paying stock or an income stock. So therefore, savers uh, and pensioners rely on the income that we provide. And that income is obviously going to get recycled back into society. So uh, last year was a, a solid year of recovery from us from a difficult year the previous year. Um, the, the coronavirus only stuck in the last couple of weeks. So we were very clear that we, uh, having had a decent year uh, and, and having had enough liquidity uh, in the company, we we're in a position to pay. We did consider all the angles around that carefully, but ultimately honouring a commitment, a five-year commitment we made back in 2018 to uh, the various savers and investors um, uh, who rely on that money, uh, essentially, is something that was important to us. So we are able to do it. Uh, and on top of that, given... Um, all the opportunities in the Green Revolution, we're also able to announce a £7.5 billion investment programme over the coming five years, um, uh, principally around the UK and Ireland, into green infrastructure. That sounds very promising. Um, let me, I had intended uh, originally to go to Mark first. So let me go back to you, Mark. You're there? I'm here. Listen um, intently. Good. So... Um, your your message has been that we're facing this once in a lifetime opportunity to rebuild a, a more sustainable economy so that we can withstand the next shock coming our way. And it, it has been heartening, uh, I'm sure to you, you know, certainly to me to see the return of trust in, in experts, in scientists. Um, but I have to admit that I am a little bit worried and that that is sort of the the journalist in me. Um, is there not a risk, and do you not worry, that the pressures that companies are now facing coming out of this pandemic, a very uncertain, at least medium term, um, high unemployment probably, uh, you know, they'll have to spend on potentially reskilling, re uh, retraining, that this is going to deter from moving as fast as you would have liked with action on, on uh, emissions? Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, neither, neither path is a foregone conclusion, but there's a series of reasons why one would expect a shift to a more sustainable economy to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. I mean, it's quite often set up as, oh, this is a luxury as opposed to one of the core goals. Of, uh, of, of the country first point. And if you're talking on purpose and trying to determine where, you know, what is the economy for, where do we want to go? That's a pretty good place to start and figure out when, when there's a very clear objective first point. Second point is um, the economic policy maker in me, and I'm not making policy anymore, but um, if I were, um, one of the key things would be to set direction for the economy. So we're going to have a period of time where we may be surprised, but more likely than not, uh, partly because of the unemployment situation, partly because of the pressure that people have felt, and a lot of people watching this would recognize this, uh, about fear of lost jobs, fear of the future, uh, anxiety, etc., cetera, uh, realizing they have much less of a personal buffer than they might have thought, um, that levered consumption, high debt consumption, if I can put it that way, may be less of a driver. I mean, consumption is always going to be the biggest component of GDP, but it's a question of the delta on it. It's the way to grow that drives it. So there's going to be less there. It is, and the trading environment is going to be difficult internationally uh, for a variety of reasons, relocalization, variety of factors. So what does that leave you? It leaves you with investment, public and private investment. What the private sector needs to know is what's the medium term orientation of the economy. And part of that direction can be set, uh, part of it's set by purpose, but part of it's also set by public policy. And if you look at, uh, I'll use an example because they are uh, in the public domain, but if you look at both uh, the, uh, the presidency, the European presidency's proposal for the common budget, the 750 billion euros, or the German budget of 10 days ago, uh, many, many 
budget, 140 billion euros. Uh, both of them are one third to 40 percent sustainable. Okay, that's the orientation. That's the money where your mouth is to use uh, 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 Elster's phrase and uh, example there. But also related to that, a number of regulatory interventions that point direction, for example, for hydrogen fuel blends and other, where's the economy go in the medium sector? So if you work back and you're sitting in the private sector, you say, okay, money where your mouth is, there's that direction. There's where regulation is going. And thinking about what is required for this bigger goal to be accomplished, that gives a good sense of where you go. And if I can, apologies, Alistair, if I bore on SSE, but when you think of the nature of your purpose and that shift to the net zero economy, and that objective is reinforced coming out of this, which it has been, look, when the Canadians did uh, measures, that's what they did. When the Kiwis did measures, when the Europeans, thus far, the track record is, is pretty good, it's still early days, but it's there. I think that is what drives it. And there are a host, again, last point, if I may, but as if I were a policymaker, of course, you'd be looking for the Venn diagram that overlaps sustainability, jobs, economic multipliers. There are a series of, of measures um, uh, that actually fall into that camp uh, that are more suited for the shorter term uh, uh, policy initiatives uh, and then building out the medium term. I'm sure you'd agree, Mark, that this has not uh, been a crisis that sort of underlines the uh, the eagerness um, towards multi multilateralism. Um, and the, you know, there's been a lot of uh, competition, uh, a move towards a more protectionist policies. To what extent do you think that that will impact um, action on on climate? Yeah, it's, um, I think the, there is a greater um, willingness to engage in forms of protectionism or relocalization. Um, and some of it's entirely sensible. I mean, one of the lessons of, of the pandemic is don't rely on a global supply chain if you want PPE. If that's your, if you've, if you've outsourced your, uh, your buffer, your, you know, your, your, people were caught short and there's a, a variety of those. So some of it makes sense. Some of it also gets momentum and moves there. And there may be, and there's some of this uh, differential, um, if certain countries or regions are far out in front of others, and there's some free riding on this, then that may lead to some of the protection. That said, um, this is one of the areas, this is, as you rightly, and you know, um, you study this, you know, and you live it, um, it is a more difficult geopolitical environment. Um, in those environments, you look for areas where you have common cause um, and that have not been affected and where there's win-win opportunities. And one of the opportunities, and this is a great strength of uh, the UK, is that part of what could come out in the run uh, to COP is to unlock some of the bigger private financial flows, not just domestically, but cross-border related to sustainability into some of the big emerging and, and, and developing emerging powers, but also developing that's a, that's a conversation worth having um, and it relates to a broader purpose and, and, and it's a very practical conversation that uh, I, I, in my view the UK can bring a lot as, uh, as COP presidency and last point that the private sector from the city through to Edinburgh is very up for because they can see part some of the solutions to uh, to that. Um, thanks. Uh, it, it's a good time actually to bring in Darren Jones, who's um, a chair of the Business Energy and Industrial Strategy um, Committee. Um, uh, Darren, you're running a commission on, on post-pandemic economic growth. And I'm just wondering what you're hearing from people up and down um, the country in terms of economic needs and to what extent does uh, climate change feature in their in, in the priority list? I guess, you know, you know, the theme here is that I, I think there, there is a, some worry that um, climate change will, will be relegated to a lesser uh, priority after what was, I think, a turning point last year. Well, well, thanks for the question. Thank you to the British Academy for this important summit and for the invitation to be with you um, uh, today. We've announced a number of inquiries on my committee, the Business Energy and Industrial Strategy Committee, that are, are related to this topic. Um, you've mentioned our um, super inquiry on post-pandemic growth, which will 
cover a whole host of regions, uh, 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 issues around constraints on growth before the pandemic, how the pandemic hit that, uh, and what we want to see in terms of building back better um, as we recover and grow the British economy, meeting a whole host of public policy objectives. And we will dive into issues such as industrial strategy and devolution and um, fiscal policy and the like. I'm very clear that whether we're looking at uh, local or regional government or how you define industrial strategy or how you spend research and innovation funding, that the net zero transition is baked into that. It's not a distinct inquiry. It's, it's inherent to everything that we're now talking about. As Mark said at the beginning, it's a legislative target for us in the United Kingdom and everything needs to be pointing um, in that direction. We do, however, have a, a separate inquiry on COP26 and the net zero transition because um, with our leadership of COP26, we have to be um, providing international leadership on, uh, on reaching these goals. And uh, I'm conscious now more than ever that for many uh, developing countries around the world whose um, fiscal position will be um, extremely difficult for wealthier countries, even in this circumstance, to come along and say, well, you need to start borrowing and investing and spending money on renewable energies um, or other forms of net zero technology when uh, they're unable to pay the day to day. Uh, it's still a huge obligation on us as wealthier nations um, to be able to provide international leadership. And so we will be um, uh, uh, looking for evidence, for suggestions from uh, stakeholders and, 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 and trying to influence government policy on the scope of our ambitions on COP26, um, as well as ensuring a green transition in our um, economic recovery and growth. Just on a um, on the point uh, on on a related um, point. So, so the other concern is that the pandemic is going to widen, or it has already widened, inequality, and that it complicates the whole leveling up strategy um, of of the government. How do you think the government can reconcile the different uh, pressure? And would you expect that this is by possibly taking over some companies with conditionalities? I think it depends on the circumstances, but I do agree that we need to see a more proactive and open strategy from the government about its approach to the transition out of emergency measures and into the recovery. Um, uh, many sectors have appeared before my committee concerned about the fact that other countries, for example, France and Germany, as you know, well as the European Commission, the United States, are kind of ahead of the game, really, compared to where we are in the UK in terms of the approaches that we're going to uh, take. Uh, we expect a speech from the Prime Minister in the next week or two uh, with some updates and further detail after the summer recess, but time is of the essence um, for production capacity for jobs across the country. Um, and I'm very clear that the role that my committee plays is not just holding ministers and government to account, but is trying to pull together all of the sources of relevant evidence, the best ideas from across the country to try to inform government policy so it's effective as possible. And one of my concerns is, uh, it's an old problem, but it's about the delivery of public policy. Uh, you can't just kind of pull a lever across the road here in Downing Street and things happen. Uh, and on levelling up and inequality, which we know has been a very long running issue in the United Kingdom, um, I don't think we've got the right institutional setup to be able to deliver growth uh, meaningfully and locally for people where it's needed. And so we will want to um, be taking evidence on that to assess uh, the effectiveness and impact of current government policies and to put forward proposals about how it can be done better in the future. So you also have to take into account the um, the impact of Brexit. Is that something that you're also looking at as part of um, this work? Well, Brexit uh, is a political reality. Um, I, I was a very um, avid Remainer and remain so, but I'm also a pragmatist and uh, we all know what the um, uh, the majorities are now in the House of Commons, so it will be happening and there won't be an extension, extension of the transition period um, uh, at the end of the year. Uh, and so you've kind of got to build in those political realities into uh, the work that you're doing. So yes, that's part of it. But there are some interesting geopolitical questions here as well, whether you're thinking about fiscal policy um, or spending priorities, but also around the regulatory environment in which we work, whether it's competition and state aid or um, consumer law, and whether we kind of pivot more to a um, a, a US friendly regulatory position in line with you know, ambitions in the free trade agreement negotiations, or whether we remain more European, or whether we try to carve something that is particularly British that fits in the middle. Um, this is a very significant debate and will be really important for setting the foundations for the type of economy that we want to try to stimulate as we recover from the pandemic and, and grow in the future. And 
the point on crises, I think, is really important. You know, we've had a public health crisis. We're going to have an economic crisis. We've got a climate crisis. Crises are now normal. Um, and we need to um, find the opportunities within them to modernize and reform and to keep up the pace of modernization and reform um, in order to deliver for you know, our constituents across the country, but also for Britain to be competitive in the world. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to turn to Professor Nairi Woods, the, who's Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government um, and Professor of Global Economic Governance at uh, Oxford. Hi, um, Nairi. So, as I was saying, last year was uh, a turning point in many ways in the fight against climate change and also in the corporate world's embrace of more inclusive um, capitalism. We had the business roundtable statement about stakeholders, for example. So definitely a move in, in the right direction. How, how do you think we, we can ensure that the pandemic reinforces uh, these trends rather than sets them back? I think you may be on mute. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Look, uh, sitting as Dean of a School of Government here at Oxford University, it's the government side that interests me. You know, governments are, of course, elected to represent people. But what's really interesting about the theme of this conference around purpose and the corporation is that it's very often, often corporations and businesses that push purpose first. You know, I was speaking yesterday, 200 years ago in Britain, it was wealthy factory owners that pushed the government to legislate to stop children dying in factories working or, and to stop children working in factories. Um, and, and, and likewise today in Britain, it's the business sector itself, which in some quarters is pushing the government to think about what the bones of a new deal should actually look like. And I think that's, that's a first important feature. But a second is that to get purpose beyond the CEO speech, to get purpose actually into the office of the chief financial officer of a co corporation and across the rest of the company um, usually does require a partnership with government. It usually requires a regulatory effort by government. Um, Mark Carney you know, highlighted some of the ways that can take place, but if you take something simple like reporting, it's not simple, but take reporting and transparency. We know from the research done in the 80s and 90s by people like Robert Repetto, that environmental, mandated environmental reporting standards were often kept to in name through the SEC regulation. But when researchers went back and looked at that and verified the information, it showed that actually most of the information was false and that there was nobody actually verifying and checking that the information that was being submitted as part of mandatory reporting was in, so in other words, there you're needing uh, government in partnership with regulatory agencies and business to make sure that the, the, the level playing field is even for both the honest companies who are reporting adequately and that they have confidence that other companies are also being required to report um, fairly. And at the moment, it feels as though we need to sort of help get the government side of the effective of partnership to move as quickly as business coming out of this crisis and to set and chart a way forward. Just picking up on your, your previous questions, Rula. What's, what's, I think, what could now be accelerated in Britain is it, it's really government that needs to conduct the orchestra and ensure that all the health data, the infection data, region by region, city by city, is matched and paired with business strategies industry, sector by sector, safe work practices. Now, other countries have done this and other, other states have done it in other parts of the world. But that, little, that piece, which has to be done hand in hand with local government and with business, seems to me the place where Britain now most needs to go urgently to get the economy back working along with managing the virus. And then to look ahead and think, how do we start using the emergency assistance, which the government did a terrific job getting quickly out the door, but how do we now make that assistance, assistance not just to keep restaurants closed, but to keep restaurants adapting so that, they, so that small restaurants create websites, you know, hire delivery people, you know, think about it for firms and, and workers. I think the adaptation is gonna happen. And the, and the investments that the previous speakers have, have spoken to 
I think to really take forward the business roundtable statement that you mentioned, Rula, in a meaningful way, to make it something other than just, you know, Davos speak, is going to take as I said, a really effective partnership with business, the record of voluntary self-regulatory codes is a very poor one. I spoke yesterday about the chemi chemical sector responsible care code in its first few years, where actually, when we look back, we see that it was the dirtiest companies that joined it, and they actually did worse than companies that didn't join it. So we've got to, we've got to separate great purpose and great intent from what actually happens and the kind of partnership with government that's going to be required to make sure that great companies can do great things without worrying that others are cheating. You make a very uh, interest, uh, interesting point. Why do you think this is not happening, that partnership that, that you're talking about? Because it is, you know, just to also go back to my earlier question, bet between the pandemic and, and Brexit, th there is a need for new regulation and, an, and a new thinking uh, about, you know, what, what kind of economy do we want to have? What kind of country are we going to be? What is our what is our place? What is our competitive advantage? What is our place in the world? So, why is that not happening? I think that different crises require different skills. Now, Mark Carney would know better than me what it took to manage the financial crisis, but you could think about that as more of a command and control crisis, which could be solved somewhere between the Bank of England, the Treasury, and the city. Um, this crisis, this coronavirus crisis, requires the government to be actually extraordinarily humble about what they can and cannot do without proper partnerships. They actually have needed from the beginning really close relationships with every local government, with every city government, with businesses at local level and across the nation, with universities. And I think that um, I think it's shone a spotlight on the fact that all of those partnerships need a lot more work in Britain. And it, it's got to start with government being open to the fact, coming to the table and saying, we can't actually do this on our own. And the governments that we track in the Blood Atlantic School, we're tracking all government responses around the world. The governments that have done best are actually the governments that have come to the table and said, we can't do this on our own. We actually need to do this in partnership, which means we bring these people in, not just to tell them what to do, but to ask them, what part of the solution could they deliver? I think the government is starting to do that. And I think it's going to need to do much more of that to succeed in both managing the virus and getting the economy going. Maybe we can get, get a comment from, from Mark uh, on this, but let me first turn to Dan Labard, who's the CEO of Crown Estate, uh, which manages the monarchy's uh, land buildings. Um, Dan? Hi, Rula, how are you? Hi, good. I see you now. Um, you're you're in a core sustainability sector because building and construction matter matter hugely for for climate change. Um, when I when I read about the comp your company, though, I see that there's a lot of investment in in green energy and in in wind farm. Um, what about, tell us a little bit about how you manage that and what do you do about the rest of um, the energy that, that you're producing? No, it's a, it's a good question. Well, and I think just uh, for the audience, um, our portfolio includes um, the seabed, which we're custodians of around England, Northern Ireland and Wales, uh, and a large property portfolio across the country, um, pretty much uh, ubiquitously and, uh, and a core holding in London in the West End. Um, and uh, I think turning to uh, one of the um, concepts that the previous speakers have talked about, this concept of partnership, I'm also a big advocate of. And I think if you look at the UK's offshore wind sector, which is now you know, on a trajectory to hit between 30 and 40 gigawatts over the next 10 to 15 years, um, that has been a collaboration between government, uh, the third sector and the private sector. Uh, and now we're you know, on the brink of an industry without subsidy uh, that um, uh, is going to be a big producer of energy for the UK. A huge success story, and I think we should talk about that, that more. Um, but as you said, you know, what, what, our, what our portfolio also shows is that different industries are operating in different ways. And uh, 
Um, when I look at the offshore wind sector, obviously it's a great green story, but when I look at property, uh, I think um, it has a lot of catching up to do. Uh, and I think, um, uh, you know, one of the things that this crisis has also uh, leveled things out on is, is, for example, making the point that if you're a landlord, you cannot be a rent collector in isolation. You have to add value to your customers because, you know, ultimately, um, let's say, for example, in the retail sector, um, you're not going to have tenants lining up to take up vacant space. You've got to work in partnership with your customers. And you've got to think about the world through, you know, your purpose, you know, and theirs. And I think this comes back to the point is that I think one of the things that this particular health crisis has highlighted is that the system is incredibly fragile. So stability, which I think subconsciously in business were taken as a given, uh, isn't a given and it needs to be protected. And in order to protect stability, we need to look at what's coming at us and take ourselves to the world holistically, dealing with environmental issues, uh, dealing and supporting social issues. Now, we can't be the solution as business in our own right, but we have to play our part in you know, nudging the world in the right direction, which is why I think purpose, a purpose-informed strategy as a business tool and drawing on things that I think are incredibly progressive, things like TCFD that Mark talked about, um, there are now, I think, there is now the toolbox for us to navigate a sensible path that aligns with strategy and is more holistic in how we think about value and create value. So uh, I will, I'm going to move to audience uh, questions and I have a, a whole list of them here. And there's one that allows me to ask the question I wanted to ask Mark, uh, but it is from uh, Jyoti Banerjee. Uh, Mark, does the strategic, no, sorry, I think this keeps moving, okay. So, no, I'm going to go to the jo uh, a question from Jonathan Winter. To achieve changes of the kind that we've been uh, talking about, how does the relationship between business and government need to change? Well, I think, I think, there are a few issues. Um, there are some issues, and I'm going to pick up on something Nairi touched on, yeah. um, which is there's only so far you can take private voluntary codes, or uh, in the case, say, of the TCFD, which is really, I mean, it was catalyzed by the public sector, but it's a private initiative. You can only take them so far before um, you want to embed the best elements of that in a comprehensive uh, approach, which is part of what we're putting on the table for COP. So moving it on a pathway to mandatory in as many countries as possible. So that's that's one example. I think secondly, the um, the understanding, one of the things that, and, and I think Daryl would have a, a, a very good view on this, is that uh, there is a shared development of an understanding of the art of the possible and where the techno technological choke points or pinch points are in the transition. So what does it take to flip hydrogen from attractive to commercial, for example? And is that actually an opportunity for the UK as a whole in order to do so? It, it could well be. What about you know AI and grid optimization and what's necessary? Now, it's some of that will be regulatory because some of it could be pull factor on the regulatory side, some could be primary research, some could be business. So that sort of collaborative approach, or at least that, that more, um, and again, I think Darren was saying this, which is actually moving down into, not the weeds, but the, um, to the coal face, uh, to use a bad analogy again, today's my day of bad analogies, but the, um, you know, to get into the detail of it and what's possible, what's not. Now, to flip it, and I'll stop here, sometimes these conversations, not this conversation, but around energy transition, other things will say, well, look at, um, let's, I'll take hydrogen and say, you know, it's, it's not yet commercial, therefore it's a problem. Actually, when you look, I mean, the way I look at it is the opposite, which is, well, it needs to become commercial. What are the elements of it that need to you know, get economies of scale or some additional innovation? I may want to put my venture capital, my more aggressive uh, investment in that area. I certainly want to know what government's doing around it. I'm not asking them to subsidize and build up, but I want to know that that's part of the strategy. So that's a long-winded way of saying that uh, these types of collaborative approaches need to be there. There is a role on regulation which informed by um, what 
is possible for business and in the best interest of the country. And then there's just some basic things which have been developed and taken to a point. And if I may generalize that last aspect to the broader uh, British Academy agenda, the future of the corporation, there are a number of things that uh, this process has put on the table around corporate governance and stewardship and other factors. And I think that is, you know, the question is, okay, is, are they ready uh, now in order to be enshrined? That's a broader set of issues uh, away from climate, but that, that, th those are three examples of where I would look to. You'd like uh, to come in, uh, to come in uh, now. You're muted. Uh, no, no. I mean, I, I was just nodding in actually uh, with uh, what Mark was saying. I, I, I do sometimes think that that um, it 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 would help governments to think about the corporate sector in a more nuanced way, not just by industrial sector, but to understand that that in one sector, different companies have very different interests. Some are consumers of other companies, and so they have a desire to see that kind of reform. Some are more vulnerable to what auditors and, and insurers and activists say, and so that can be a point of leverage. Some, in some areas, there are corporate newcomers that want to break in, and therefore that new regulation can help. So there's different, I think, understanding the very different interests that business brings to the table could enable government to take a more informed and as sometimes um, a bolder view of where it is that they can move and, and, and with whom they can move rather than taking the kind of lowest common denominator view and stepping back in, in fear. A, a more op opportunistic approach as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go back to Jyoti Banerjee's um, question, ap apologies for uh, mentioning it and then moving on. Uh, does the strategic reset for companies need to incorporate carbon pricing? Uh, surely the social reset demands that. Uh, they want you to take uh, to take this on, Mark. But I so start. But I also I'll, like I'll, to hear I'll, from others. Exactly. I'll be I'll be brief. Uh, I think the uh, it's necessary. Um, and certainly a shadow, I mean, it's reasonable to ask every company, um, certainly energy intensive ones, what their shadow price of carbon is. Uh, I would note again, uh, it's the third time I mentioned it, but you know, BP, part of what they did on car, uh, in their uh, reassessment of asset values was to uh, update their view on where the potential future carbon price could go. Uh, so short answer, yes, in terms of the strategic should have a view and, um, and then investors can take a judgment whether that's likely. Alistair, would you like to comment? Sure. Just checking, I was unmuted. Um, yeah, I, I, look, I, I think the simple answer for us is absolutely yes. It's uh, it's very much where we want to be. Uh, I, I think equally looking at uh, looking at things like science-based science targets is important uh, for us. We've also uh, based some of our key goals for the next decade around the UN um, Sustainable Development framework as well. So I think I think there are, there are a number of things that companies can do around the wider issue of sustainability. But carbon, I, I think now is absolutely a massive issue, particularly when it's enshrined in law that we've got to get to net zero. And therefore, people having clear scenarios, having clear science based targets, um, and, uh, and giving disclosures around that in terms of uh, in terms of risk, uh, and, and also making sure that uh, boards uh, are making it clear that they're taking into account um, how carbon is going to impact upon them uh, in years to come is very, very important. And for us um, in the energy sector, um, I think we've got more opportunities uh, to move more quickly than, uh, than some parts, which is why we're, we're, we're calling for net zero in the electricity sector by 2040. Um, there's a very interesting question that I'd like to address to uh, Darren and, uh, and Dan. Um, Customers trust local companies and caring about the area they live in. Um, how do we ensure government and companies recognize the local dimension? This, this is from Ian McGuffin. Well, thanks for that question. I think the, um, whether, you th whether you're talking about decentralization of energy or whether you're looking at decentralization of spending and decision-making, I'm an advocate for 
going down to the local community level. And as I said in my remarks earlier, I actually think that when you're trying to level up the geographical inequalities across the country, you're going to be able to achieve that more if you actually devolve real decision making power, real spending power to local communities. But I do think that devolution in the UK, when we talk about growth and, and also about energy, um, they're not geared in the right way to actually deliver that. And, you know, I'm an MP in Bristol, and I think I've got six or seven tiers of local and regional government now who are interested in growth. But some of my colleagues in the House will be in parts of the area where they've still just got the kind of local council. Uh, and the question is, well, how do you kind of do that in the right way uh, across the country? Uh, and that's going to require Whitehall to want to move into a more collaborative way of deciding on public policy priorities, trusting local leaders to make local decisions, um, but it's also going to involve some reforms. And I think that's going to be an important part of this agenda around delivery of public policy objectives. We can't just degree it from Westminster and then and then assume that the outcomes are going to happen in the right way for, for people right across the country. Yeah. yeah, just building on that, I think, um, you know, I think companies ignore local communities at their peril, um, purely and simply. And, um, and I think one of the um, ways to address that is to ensure that if you're operating locally, your, 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 your makeup of your employee base and the way that you look at governance also operates locally. Um, I don't think you can um, sit you know, in a corporate ivory tower and assume that you know how your business will hit the ground. And I, and I think you take on risks by trying to do it differently. Um, and the other point that I wanted to address, just coming back to the partnership with government, I think as companies explore the social and environmental space. And we have to remember also that, you know, we talk about carbon as carbon, and I do agree that it is, it is an incredibly important priority, but it's, it has a social impact. And, you know, everything's pointing to social inequality being exasperated by a lack of controlling carbon emissions, not the opposite. And I, and I think that as companies navigate further into the social impact space and the carbon space, that they're going to have to partner, partner with governments in different ways because, you know, profit has been the domain of companies with governments having regulation and taxation that was arm's length. I think when it comes to social and environmental issues, partnerships are the only way forward. So we need to understand the country's industry. We need to understand its, its carbon strategy in order to be able to operate effectively. Thank you for that. Um, there's another question. Well, there are several good questions, but I'm going to pick this one. Uh, it's anonymous. Will government and global debt levels challenge or dampen uh, speed of focus on sustainability? Mark, I think this one has you written all over it. The um, well, there's a couple of uh, couple of likely realities in the macroeconomic environment. The first is exactly what at the heart of the question. I mean, there's probably 20 percentage points, give or take, of um, government debt added over the course of uh, the first phase of the crisis. Um, and then, again, depending on the jurisdiction, but something clear, near that in terms of corporate leverage uh, as well. So there's a quite substantial increase in, in leverage. Uh, the first point, so that there, there is a, a challenge that comes with that. And that's part of what occasions a, a restructuring and potentially on the corporate side, some re you, know, you need a plan once you've levered on that. This is the point I was trying to make earlier. Second thing is that all evidence points and experience points, at least for a period, that this is likely to reinforce uh, the low for long interest rate environment. Um, and then when you combine that, and this is this observation is made by others, but, I, but it's right, I, in my view, you combine that with likely caution on the consumer side. Some of the consumer side is not going to come back, but just it, it, it would. Consumer led recoveries are ultimately unsustainable, anyways. Um, and there's reason to expect that it will be dampened for a period of time. Uh, it just puts that weight on investment, including on public investment. So, on the margin, I actually think this falls on, on the margin in terms of um, uh, uh, the level of interest rates and the economic imperatives and the social need, right, whether it's regional uh, leveling up um, uh, sustainability or other uh, social needs, um, uh, they point in the direction of more investment. Um, and so, yes, there will be some uh, further leveraging of, uh, I think, virtually all major economies uh, over the course of the medium term. It better be money well spent, 
though, and it better be money well spent, uh, including in frameworks, fiscal frameworks that, 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 you know, again, we talk a lot about transparency, but are clear about what's actually an investment for future uh, versus what has been rebranded um, as um, as a, a productivity enhancing investment, but we're not going to get out of the low interest rate trap um, without a uh, scale of investment um, to help help push things up. So it points in that. It, in the end, the challenge points in the same in, in the direction of more uh, more investment. I think we still have time for one other question, and I'm going to pick this one um, from Colin Jones. Where will the big productivity gains come from in a more a new, more sustainable economy? And will productivity still be as important in corporate scoreboards? Um, who would like to take that on? Alistair, what do you think? So I, I, if, if we take a very simple example in, in my sector, we've, we've seen offshore wind uh, and I'm sure Dan will study this pretty hard, uh, go from sort of 140 pounds a unit down to about 40 pounds a unit. Now that's taken maybe 10 years uh, to get there, but it has done that. Uh, I think when you when you look at CCS, which is something that we certainly look at, and whether it's CCS or hydrogen, um, I think they're both, well, they've both got real potential. Uh, I think there are opportunities there. I think the UK happens to have a specific opportunity in CCS because it has so much offshore um, injection capacity in the North Sea. I, I also think looking at nuclear versus uh, wind, where you can industrialize a process, I think that's really, really crucial uh, and important. And so uh, one large nuclear plant or two or three, I don't think you get the savings from, you know, we've got 1500 wind turbines, um, which we've installed uh, since we started going, and we've got about another 500 very, very large ones that are that are due to come in shortly. And us and other companies have, have therefore been able to deliver um, deliver these enormous savings. So I think CCS has some of that potential uh, if you look at a um, rolling out a fleet. I think the, the the other thing which goes back to that that localism, I do think more resilient local supply chains are important, uh, mm -hmm. and, and people have to invest some money in that. Uh, and, and there's an issue about very short term, get the cheapest price today, or do you or do you build an industry? Because I, I see the, the renewable space and the sustainability space for companies being very long term profitable. I think it will attract long term investment over a period of time. And therefore, we can afford to invest a little bit up front uh, and, and, and scatter that money amongst various people. Because I think the coronavirus has driven people to be more local in terms of everybody's in Scotland, you're not allowed, uh, in theory, more than five, five miles away from your home to take your exercise and whatever. You've got a lot, uh, a lot more sense of community. And I think people have to respond to that um, generally. Uh, and I certainly hope we will as part of this green recovery. Um, Mark, I'm going to give you the last word with one, one minute. I'll go over. No, I won't go over. I, I mean, I, I think what uh, was just said um, highlights uh, a number of pretty big medium term productivity opportunities uh, that are there in the energy transition. Maybe they won't all be realized or they'll come in a different sequencing, but, but there's that there. I think one thing that uh, to take up macro productivity, which is I think what you're asking, is we have sort of countervailing forces here because to some extent, the necessary relocalization, and I mean relocalization not within the UK, but from a global approach of, um, uh, of, of supply chain, certain aspects of resilience, that will reduce productivity, but for the for the benefit of having greater resilience. I mean, that's the trade-off that's being made. Um, on the other hand, um, I don't know that we should underestimate um, the potential productivity gains that have been spurred by, and we've had examples already from a couple of uh, CEOs today in terms of how quickly decades worth of adjustments uh, have been made in months in terms of the use of ICT and use of AC, a, uh, artificial intelligence. I'm aware of other examples of that where where you know, we have not, the collective we have uh, not got very much yet out of some of these really transformative technologies. All of a sudden we are. And one of the things that it does bring, and which is a good news local story, is of course it brings the ability to tap into expertise, creativity, wherever people are resident across the country. I mean, 
I don't know where, I mean, Nairi claims to be in Oxford, but she could be you know, somewhere else. I know that's a backdrop, Nairi. And um, so you can draw on that expertise across the country. That is, I mean, I'm going to speak like an economist, that is a massive productivity gain potential. Uh, but what it really is, is somebody's livelihood that's brought into a series of, uh, uh, and, and, and can be local, but also be plugged into uh, the much broader UK and global economy. And so we could have some very big productivity gains from that. I hope we do. And if we do, that will be a more sustainable, actual way of running organizations. Well, thank well, you, Mark. Thank, go ahead, Nairi. Sorry, One minute. I, I just think we've got to remember the productivity of people. This, this crisis has shone a spotlight on Britain's declining productivity of workers. Britain, it's all very well for us to talk about the high skill, and in Oxford, we see them. But Britain is suffering from a massive deficit of the kind of investment that picks up 50% of the population. And that is what both Darren and Dan have alluded to. You cannot keep cutting local government expenditure and then imagine that we're producing a generation that are going to be productive. Just this week, we heard that there are 44% more children that need fostering in this country and only half as many foster places open. And the capacity of local governments to deal with that issue has been crucified over the last decade. So there's a rebuilding project, I think, in Britain that starts with people and the productivity of people, as well as capital and the technologies that my fellow panelists have rightly highlighted. Very well said. Um, and a good way uh, to bring this panel to an end. Thank you all. Uh, I'm going to turn now um, to Colin Mayer, who will be making the final remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Rula, for that um, tremendous uh, panel. And uh, thank you to all the panelists for a really stimulating and insightful uh, discussion. We've had a uh, remarkable three days um, and we've started with a, a view that what we were looking for from these uh, sessions was a clear notion that we've moved beyond whether or why companies should adopt a corporate purpose. It's what and how. What do we mean by purpose and how should we embed it? And I, I set down a challenge to all of the participants at the beginning to demonstrate how their businesses, their institutions are responding in demonstrating that they will set about creating the purpose that we believe that they should have, namely to provide profitable solutions for the problems of people and planet. And I think we've had some real insights into how that should be brought about in terms of putting it as a core to the business, not a sideline of corporate social responsibility. Companies need to define their purposes clearly and succinctly and demonstrate that they are committed to delivering. They need to convert those challenges into business models that deliver real value for investors as well as benefits for others. And as they do that, they drive superior financial returns as well as the well-being of their stakeholders. We heard how governance is critically important in bringing about the engagement with and support of employees as key stakeholders. The need to recognize the importance of supporting all stakeholders as well as shareholders. There was suggestion about the potential benefits that might come from two-tier boards as in Germany the role of business in contributing to the well-being of future as well as current generations was emphasized. The technology session brought out the instrumental role that tech firms can play in transforming our lives, the responsibilities on them to do this, the inspired leadership that's required to achieve it, the need to demonstrate an avoidance of harm in the process, the combination of transformative technologies and business innovations that can confer tremendous benefits and the many, not just the few, for the future, as well as the present. But we heard about the limitations. The limitations on technology were discussed, that we want to see 
humans. We want to see them in charge. We want to be able to relate to them and have trust in them. It's also suggested that business doesn't always do this out of the goodness of their heart. We need regulation to set the boundaries. Regulation should be sensible, nimble, and promote corporate purposes. Business in turn needs to recognize its social license to operate, and we need a better partnership between business and government. Governments need to help companies to define their social licenses and ensure they are fulfilled. We heard in the investor and ownership session how purpose can be embedded in organizations through supportive ownership, promoting their purposes and providing the resources and investments required to achieve them. Employee ownership was argued to be an effective way of committing to purpose and the firm's most important stakeholders. Investors need to provide the really long-term, intergenerational horizons required by purposeful business. And we've just heard a session and throughout the summit how a clear sense of purpose is vital for steering companies and financial institutions through crises, prior prioritizing the trade-offs that have to be made and identifying priorities post-crisis. They require a strategic reset aligned with a social and environmental reset. Reset. They need data to show whether they're actually transitioning and delivering their purposes. The greater resilience associated with this has been demonstrated in already. And if done well, it creates a competitive advantage for firms, economies, and, and nations in achieving the greater resilience to crisis. So we have had a remarkable few days, uh, and I'm extremely grateful to all of the people who've participated uh, in the three days. Uh, the way in which they've interacted has truly been inspirational. Uh, I'd like to thank the many supporters of the program, and in particular, the main supporters, Mohammed and Mercy, founder and chairman of the Mercy Foundation, and the Society of the Advancement of Management Studies. And I'd like to thank all of our other supporters as well. I'd like to thank uh, the British Academy and the staff of the British Academy. As you can imagine, this has been a formidable logistical and technical exercise. Uh, and I'm extremely grateful for the remarkable work that you've done in bringing this uh, summit uh, to fruition. And I'd in particular like to thank all of you I think some of you have actually been here from the beginning to the end. Uh, and if you have, you deserve a medal for doing that because I think that some of you have been asking questions throughout uh, the three days. But thank you very much to all of you for having uh, participated in this. We've come a long way over the two years of the program. And in this, its final year, we intend to complete the reform of making purposeful business the natural concept for business and nation states around the, around the world. Stay with us, please, as we conclude this journey. And thank you very much indeed. I'd finally just like to introduce Mohammed Amersi, who is the uh, main funder of the, uh, of the program, to say a few words in conclusion about the program. Thank you very much, um, Colin. Um, I am humbled uh, to be on the stage now and to um, offer some concluding remarks to such an august audience on this very important and timely topic. It is a pleasure to note that what started out more than two years ago as an idea is now blossoming into a full-blown movement. Thanks to the immense hard work of the British Academy, and you, Colin. The supreme rigor and discipline with which this topic has been tackled is truly remarkable, and my foundation is proud to have been the first and biggest financial supporter of this initiative. For me personally, it has been a privilege to contribute modest intellectual capital to this initiative. When we were first approached two years ago to provide support for the future of the corporation, the idea resonated very well with me because it brought back memories of a parchment dating back to 1850 that my great-grandfather gave to his son, my grandfather, that said, son, 
always remember the eight S's while doing business. These eight S's are the stakeholder duties that you owe. S for the supreme creator, S for the supplier, the servant, the served, the state, the shareholder, surroundings, and society. Give them all their dues and you will never go wrong. Today, the narrative is more sophisticated, but the principles remain the same. There are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. It seems that 2020 very much falls into the latter category. We are now facing climate change as an existential crisis, as we heard, inequality on a colossal scale, irreversible dependency on technology where we have had no choice in its adoption, and we are combating an erstwhile invisible enemy that cannot be seen or touched, but yet has forces in every corner of the globe and which has wreaked the biggest economic, societal and human disaster that we have experienced in a century. It spares no one, however rich or powerful or famous you are, it has shown that no one is safe until we are all safe. With the prevailing anti-globalization climate that we now live in, that permeates many geographies, trust in governments and institutions being at an all-time low, it is about time for capitalism to step in and provide the leadership and unity that is badly needed. But before it does this, it needs to have a very hard look at itself and to see if it is fit for purpose. In doing so, it will not escape its attention as to how the corporation, being the engine of capitalism, has undergone a fundamental change from being an organization with predominantly tangible assets to the mindful corporation with intangible assets and soon to be taken over by the robot corporation. While the mindful corporation has made as we know, immense contribution to economic prosperity and development. Levels of income and social inequality have widened alongside the loss of privacy, privacy, respect and dignity. At this present time, it feels that capitalism is seen by many, and I will use an analogy there if I'm permitted, as akin to a large apartment block, which until 30 years ago was the object of envy but in the last generation, its character has changed. The penthouses at the top get, keep getting larger and larger. The apartments in the middle are feeling more and more squeezed and the basement has flooded. To round it off, the elevator is no longer working, meaning the very rich do not become poor and the very poor cannot, cannot become rich. But what is being suggested here by all over the last three days and many more is definitely not the abolition of capitalism, as it would be just as illogical to suggest abolishing capitalism because it hasn't abolished poverty, as it would be to suggest abolishing places of worship because they have not abolished sin. Instead, the challenge is to humanize it, whereby true free enterprise is unleashed in the context of a sustainable environment, providing equal opportunities and benefiting all stakeholders. As a consequence, the question of our time, one which will require cycles of endless compassion and creativity, as well as cycles of infinite resourcefulness and the cultivation of abundance, generosity and hope, rather than fear, limits and greed will be not how much can I get for how little I give, but how much can we give for all we get. Turning now to purpose. This is a summer of purpose as events later in this week involving Muhammad Yunus and the UN will also spell out. As we have heard, purpose lies at the heart of the corporation and should occupy a permanent important space there, but it is also paramount that purpose occupies the heart of the operating system of humans too. After all, it is humans that for now control corporations. 
In the purpose system, governance that maximizes short-term financial interests and only measures how much business gets done is replaced with governance that embraces responsibility to society, long-term goals, and also measures more comprehensively how business gets done. It is a system of shared values and principles that guide people on what they should and shouldn't do. In particular, tax avoidance by individuals and corporations should be a non-starter. The accounting profession, the investing community and regulators need to look at how to measure intangibles and discount in determining proper corporate value the multitude of capital forms that a corporate deploys to achieve its objectives. And strategic guidance given by corporates should embrace both short-term and long-term rather than short-term or long-term returns. With the future of the corporation, we now move to its final phase, which in many ways is perhaps its most important phase where we catalyze and try to drive systemic change. We have three good recent examples to learn from climate change, inequality, and the 2030 SDGs. To achieve meaningful systemic change will require a departure from the traditional top-down, hierarchical, and linear approaches to innovative and adaptive approaches, engaging broad networks of diverse stakeholders sharing an aligned vision. This will envisage engagement at the individual, the community and system levels and the wide curation and acceptance of what I call the aha moments being paradigms such as no one is in control, it is up to us, everything is connected, everything is possible to go far, go together, we can make a difference while wow, change is happening, and if not you, who? If not now, when? I hope all of you will accompany us on this final leg of our journey, as Colin said, when we join the dots with similar movements in North America, Asia, Europe, Africa, and Latin America. In all of these contexts, systemic change will only be achieved if policymakers can institute regulatory change based on meaningful representation by all of you here and all of your stakeholder constituencies of a globally aligned vision and common aspiration. We badly need you, so please do not fail us. In conclusion, I'm sure that none of us want to be remembered as the man who was so poor that all he had was money. Thank you very much. Mohammed, thank you very much indeed for those very inspiring words. I'm very grateful to you for having uh, said them. And thank you very much indeed for all the support that you've provided to this programme over such a long period of time. We're extremely grateful to you uh, and uh, I'm very grateful to you for participating today. Thank you. So thank you very much to everyone for having participated. And we look forward to welcoming you to a future summit of the future of the corporation. Thank you and goodbye.